just out of curiosity, how many of you are from this region, northeastern Minnesota? Oh good, I'm not speaking to the choir today. Um, I have made, decided that I have to make my life goal to put the Iron Ranges of Minnesota back into the American history textbooks. They have completely disappeared. Um, it is unbelievable to me that you can write seven pages about the steel industry and never mention iron ore. But they do it. Uh, the newest textbook I got, written by a, a very competent American historian, devoted um, pages to a number of minerals. Coal, copper, gold, silver, and this really important one, quartz. <laughs> Not one mention of iron ore in the entire book. It is impossible to imagine how you can write about industrialization in the United States of America without writing about iron ore. Without the iron ore that was discovered in the ground in this region of the country, there would not have been an industrial revolution of the kind that we had. And that is no exaggeration. So my life's work is to convert all the people who don't know about this region and spread the word that we matter, that we are not, even though we live out here on the edge of a wilderness, we have never been peripheral to American history. We have always been at the center of American history, particularly in the 20th century. The 20th century is the story of Minnesota iron. And I hope I can prove that to you by the end of the afternoon. Before I start, Chase Salmon uh, Osborne was once quoted, and it's published in um, a book about the Merritt brothers who discovered the Masabi Iron Range. It's called Seven Iron Men. There is a romance about iron. <clears throat> I wonder if the courageous men who seek it in the bowels of the earth realize their big part in the life of the world. Do the brave bare bodies that reflect the furnace light and the glowing, gloating glow of the smelter do their work because of a subtle subconsciousness of the fact that the wheels of the world and civilization would stop if they stopped. Iron and steel are of greater importance than wheat because there are many good substitutes for wheat. There is none for iron ore. It has a glory of usefulness all its own. Those who are associated with its production should know of the dignity of their calling, should realize it, and then their hearts and souls would fill their big bodies until brawn and spirit are one as an instrument of the joy of existence and the keen sense of service. There would be a brotherhood of iron that could not know strife if the totality of per performance could be shown to the eyes of all those who inhabit the world of steel. It's one of the best quotes I've ever heard. Jim, were you a miner? Exactly. That's why I live here. Hurrah. <laughs> all right. So thus. So I'm going to talk to you about the, the importance of Minnesota's iron range. And for those of you who don't know what Masabi means, it means sleeping giant, or it refers, it's often said to be the sleeping giant. And I've just converted that idea into um, an uncovering of the key to industrialization in the United States. There are uh, nine factors, essentially nine factors of industrialization. You have to have them in order to industrialize. Capital, and I'm not going to go into any great detail on any of them except two, capital and transportation. Natural resources is part of that because of we're talking about the Iron Range. Uh, capital, transportation, natural resources, laboring class, education, government, technology, urbanization, and settlement of the West, uh, advertising and consumer demand, and ingenuity. Believe it or not, you can study the entire hi history of industrialization in the United States by studying nothing but the Masabi Iron Range, Vermilion Iron Range, and the Cuyuna Iron Range, because every single one of those factors played a role on this, on, in this area of the country. Every single one of them. This, this area of the country is, is as urbanized as New York City. Now, we don't think of it that way. We think of us as the cap canoe capital of the world, but we're not. We were once one of the most urbanized small towns in the country. The Masabi Iron Range and this region of the state attracted 43 different ethnic groups. In 1910, the um, 
Foreign-born population of New York City was estimated to be 40% according to the United States Census. The only place more urbanized, more ethnically diverse, was right here. The foreign-born population in, on the Masabi Iron Range in 1910 was 50%. And yet when we think about urbanization and we think about um, eth, uh, immigration, we always talk about New York City, don't we? And yet this region was as ethnically diverse as any place else in the United States. Um, the laboring class, the miners here founded this town. Uh, their names aren't on the big places like Whiteside Park, but they are the founders of this town. It was their back-breaking labor that made a difference. And how many miners died in the mines in, here, in Ely? Do you remember? Was it 200 and 200, 14, something like that? Imagine, 200, over 200 men died in the mines in here in Ely alone. 200 men. Education, government, technology, urbanization, I already mentioned, advertising and consumer demand. Think about automobiles. Did we really need automobiles? Or, did, or was the consumer demand created for us that we needed automobiles? Ingenuity. Uh, the development of the open hearth furnace and the Bessemer process made it possible to use the iron ores from northern Minnesota in the steel making process. The two most significant are transportation and capital. Transportation is still important to us up here because we're so far from the rest of the world in terms of getting goods into this region. Um, the capital was the key though. And, uh, and sometime, if you ever want me to come back and talk about the difference between an accumulationist political co economy and a balanced political economy so you can understand what's happening in this country, ask me back. I'll come and talk to you about it. <laughs> but I'm not going to go into it now. But all I can tell you is that without the accumulationist political economy of the late 19th century, um, the money would not have been available for the industrialization of this region. It, created, it required huge amounts of capital to get the ore out of the ground here in northeastern Minnesota and then transport it to Lake Superior so it could get to market. Uh, the Merritt family that discovered the Masabi Iron Range on October 16, 1890 was completely undercapitalized. They would never have made it, even without the Panic of 1893, which destroyed them. Uh, they only had two, two to five million dollars invested. They had to get money out of, the Rockefeller, out of John D. Rockefeller to continue to keep, to keep going in their work, and they didn't make it. Uh, just to give you an idea of how valuable the iron ore was up here, the Chandler Mine, right here in town, paid its, pay, just hang on to your hat when you hear this figure, $100,000 a month to their investors for 19 years. Wouldn't some of that money be nice if it was back in town? $100,000 per month to shareholders for the first 19 years of operation of Chandler Mine. That's a breathtaking sum. James J. Hill made huge amounts of money on his railroad, but he made uh, plenty of money on his iron ore as well. He, um, by 1914, he had um, profited to the tune of $30 million on his iron ore investments. $30 million, and he wasn't one of the big capitalists in iron ore. He saw much more money in, uh, in shipping the ore to the lakes. U.S. Steel Corporation, one of the largest corporations this country has ever seen, was capitalized at $1.4 billion in 1905, 1905, 1901, 19, between 1901 and 1905. $1.4 billion. They were not investing $1.4 billion in steel mills. They were investing $1.4 billion in the iron ore that's under the ground of this town and on the Masabi Iron Range and the Cuyuna Iron Range. It's a breathtaking number in 1905. It's a breathtaking number today. If anybody ever wants to do an inflationary calculation on it, I'd love to know what its value would be today but it's big even, in, even at that time. Carnegie 
what became the richest man in the world because his steel, his iron and steel pro properties were bought out for five hundred million dollars. And it was the iron under the ground here that was more valuable than his steel making facilities. Rockefeller, who invested in the Merritt's operations, accrued eighty million dollars on his um, mine lands, and uh, he he purchased his. Ore carriers were purchased for an additional eight and a half million. He, uh, he, it was estimated that he gained a fifty million dollar profit on a three to five million dollar investment. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Transportation, of course, a key, and all of that was kicked off in 1862 during the Civil War by the Pacific Railroad Act and subsequent railroad acts that allowed for the construction of transcontinental railroads. Along with those transcontinental railroads came feeder lines, and the feeder lines were vitally important to the iron range because the iron had, iron had to get to the main transportation hubs. In our case, the feeder lines went to the lake, uh, but some all-rail shipments were made um, to, the, to Chicago in particular. Uh, and these are all dependent on steel. Um, the Duluth and Iron Range Railroad was completed to, from Sedan to Lake Superior in 1884. The first shipment of iron ore ever to leave, the Misa it, to leave Minnesota was July 31st, 1884 from the Sedan Mine. And if you go up to the Sedan Mine, make sure you stop halfway up the hill. There's a set of small railroad tracks heading off to one of the caves. Those are the most important tracks in Minnesota history because they opened iron ore uh, production in Minnesota. Uh, and stop there, lean down and touch them, and thank, <laughs> thank whoever did it, Charlemagne, Charlemagne Tower, for building that little railroad. It was a narrow gauge railroad. If you go down to Two Harbors, you can still see the engine on display at the Two Harbors Depot. Uh, it's preserved by the um, Lake County Historical Society. It's called the Three Spot. Uh, so these are the natural resources that are important. Iron is the key to the whole thing. Um, without iron, there is none of these others are nearly as important. There, were, there was mining in this country long before we reached the Minnesota. Uh, the 17, 17 states had iron ore production in, uh, during World War II. Um, but as you can see, in 1928, they were producing in these other states just minuscule amounts of iron. Um, between 1849 and 1929, a period of 80 years, the biggest mining district in New York State produced only 45 million tons of ore. That's not very much. That's less than 5 million tons of ore a year. Look at what just the Hall Rust Mah Mahoning Mine Complex has produced in its life. Between 1894 and 2001, uh, I haven't got the updated figures, I've got to get, it, get them from them. But 800 million tons of ore was produced from one mine complex on the Masabi Iron Range. Take the Masabi out of the whole picture and what happens to the Industrial Revolution in this country? It can't occur. It can't occur. There are six Lake Superior mining regions, um, Marquette, Menominee, Gogebic, Vermilion, Masabi, and Cuyuna. The three uh, in Michigan and Wisconsin were very important. In particular, the Marquette uh, produced ore uh, that carried the un Union through the Civil War. Uh, but without it, it would not, uh, and, and this Union would have been in trouble without that iron ore. Uh, Menominee produced uh, a huge amount of ore, as did the Gogebic, but the Masabi quickly, quickly uh, overwhelmed it. And I'm not going to go through any detail on this, but just note that the Gogebic produced in 1887 1.3 million tons of ore. Uh, 1928, the um, Marquette was producing 4.2 million tons of ore. Uh, and uh, by in 1997, the only one still operating. Uh, the M Menominee uh, was producing 5.3 million tons of ore. It would never have been enough. Uh, 